But today we'll finish 2 Corinthians, and the key verse from the passage that he read this morning is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5. Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Or do you not realize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail to meet the test? Paul's been dealing with some difficult people in the Corinthian church. And uh, his apostleship has been challenged. His leadership has been challenged. And, and he's writing these letters to correct error and to get the church on track. Sometimes he comes across, it seems, a, a little bit harsh. Second Corinthians chapter 11, verse 4. If someone comes and proclaims another Jesus than the one we proclaimed, or if you receive a different spirit from the one you received, or if you accept a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it readily enough. What he's doing is he's criticizing them for getting off base so easily, and yet it's easy for people to be led astray. And we need to be uh, aware of how people are led astray from the gospel. And here's what he says about those that crept into the church. He had started the church, it was on a firm foundation, he went, and others crept into the church, and they were destroying the, the foundation of the church, and that's why Paul is so upset. He says in 2 Corinthians 11:13, For such men, those that have done this, are false apostles, deceitful workmen. Notice what they do, though. Disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. There's a great uh, struggle in our land today of people who name the name of Christ, who claim to be preaching the word of God, who have far departed from the word of God. And Paul is saying they, they make these claims, but there's a way to measure those claims. We'll see that in a moment. Uh, but uh, they make claims that they're, they're of God. They're doing what God wants them to do. But notice what he goes on to say in chapter 11 uh, of, of 2 Corinthians, verse 14. No wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. If someone came into the church and said, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to mess up your minds and teach false doctrine. What would you do? You would have a reaction to it. But in all, they, instead they come in and they're, they're slick and they're smooth and they sound good and, and they, they wrap up with the impulses of the flesh and people buy into it. And Paul says, no, even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. And as he closes out this book, he encourages the believers to take a look inside of their own hearts to understand what they believe and who they are in Christ. He, he pushes them to take that look to see if they are truly, truly believers. And with that, he gives them some goals in living a God-pleasing life. And so we're going to look at two considerations that Paul forces us to look at as we look at this last chapter in 2 Corinthians. First, the believer's test testing yourself to see whether you are a believer, and then the believer's target. If I am truly a believer, how should I be living my life? Let's look at the believer's test, 2 Corinthians 13.1. He says, this is the third time I'm coming to you. Every charge must be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. Now, there are those that crept in the Corinthian church are saying, Paul may not really be an apostle, etc., and, and they're counter, counter, contradicting some of what Paul's teaching. And he says, everything needs to be tested by two or three witnesses. That's always the scriptural principle. And so, in fact, you'll find that in Numbers 3530, uh, and, and, and this principle being laid out. If anyone kills a person, the murderer shall be put to death. Notice this, on the evidence of witnesses, not witness, but witnesses. Why? But no person shall be put to death on the testimony of one witness. Why? Because this is a very important issue, and you need to have more than one witness. And in spiritual truth, you need to line up witnesses. Is this true? And of course, there's a number of witnesses that would line up. Does it? The biggest one is, does it line up with the Word of God? Is it what the Bible teaches? And that's an important thing. Deuteronomy 19.15 you have the same principle. A single witness shall not suffice against a person for any crime, for any wrong, in connection with any offense that has been committed. Only on the advice of two or three witnesses shall a charge be established. 
Now, why is this important? Well, some people come into the church and they say, I heard from God. And then they tell you what they heard from God. And now you say, well, boy, if I argue against that, am I arguing against God? And we need to be very, very careful to understand that that's not how it operates. There's always that two or three witness principle. And the first one is, does it line up with the Word of God? Years ago, when I first started in the ministry, I've been here like 33 years. With the, so I started, it's now 40 years ago. I, I, it was the only church I ever candidated for, and I, I went there. And when I was candidating, I turned to my wife and I said, the first thing we're going to do when we get, if, as, if I get to be pastor here, is fix the sound system. It is the worst, squeakiest sound system I've ever heard. Later I found out the sound system was fine. It was one of the people that was singing that had the problem. <laughs> she had the worst voice I've ever heard a human being say. It's, it sounded like a, you know, a pipe wrench being twisted on a, on a pipe, and, and it, was, it was terrible. It was just terrible. But, you know, in grace, hey, everybody should come to church and sing. So I didn't say anything. But then I found out that she felt it was God's gift for her to sing solos in front of the church. And um, she would get up and, and, and there would be weeping and gnashing of teeth as she did this solo. It was so, so incredibly painful. But she had a husband, who, an Italian guy, who had a voice like Marian Lanza. And so one Sunday she sang a song and she sang one chorus and we all were like this. And then he sang, and we're all like this. And, and, and then she'd sing the chorus again, and we'd shrivel. And, and it, was just, just, uh, it was just so sad, you know. But uh, nobody really had the courage to say, maybe, you, maybe God has called you to a different ministry. But she also had this habit of hearing from God all the time. God spoke to me, you know. And so one day she walks up to one of the ladies in the church, and she says, this week, God spoke to me, and he said that you and I are to do a duet together. Now, I can imagine that lady died right on the spot, just about, you know. So, oh, my goodness, this would be really scary. But she was biblically astute, and she said to her, oh, that's good that God spoke to you. The Bible says, out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, everything shall be confirmed. God spoke to you. As soon as he speaks to me, we'll do it. You see how you do that? And that's important to understand because everybody walks around, oh, I got a vision from God. Well, the first thing I do when someone says they got a vision from God is check out the Word of God. That's an important thing to understand. And so uh, the duet never happened. And uh, so I think that was great. Second Corinthians chapter 13, verse 2, Paul says, I warned those who sinned before and all the others and I warn them now while absent, as I did when present on my second visit, that if I come again, I will not spare them. Now, Paul is, is, a, is a leader in the church. It's his job to correct false teaching. It's his job to protect the sheep from those who would come in in disguise, even as Satan comes in as an angel of light. And he is concerned, and, and, he, and he knows who they are, and he says, I'm going to deal with it when I come in, because what they're teaching is not true. See, he gave them a warning, he repeated the warning, now he says, when I come in, I'll deal with them. And Paul would deal with them face to face, because he would protect the church. That's one of the callings of a leader of a church. And he had the ability to do that by God's grace. But that's what we all do in life. Hey, if you're a mom or a dad, and you see a child hanging out with the wrong person, and you know that there's nothing but trouble ahead, what do you do? I don't know about you, but I, I do interference. I, I step in. You know, uh, when my girls were dating in school, uh, the word went around, that's the girl that you have to meet the father before you can take her out. Of course. I want to do an interview process. I want to check things out. And, and that's important. And we have a protective role. And in the church, it's the same way. 1 Corinthians 4.21, what do you wish? Should I come to you with a rod or with love in a spirit of gentleness? Paul's heart was, I want to bring correction and helpful. I want to, I want to see the church flourish. But if I need to, 
I'll bring correction in. Because he was concerned the body of Christ does not get off course. And so that's what every church leader ought to do as a shepherd, a pastor, an elder, a leader, is to protect the flock of God. And to guard that that which is being taught comes out of the word of God. And, and that's important for uh, people to understand that. Now, it's a little more difficult today, and here's why. In Paul's day, they didn't have radio and television. Today, I see kids, they come into church, and they're like this. Dum, 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 you know? And, and I say, you know, I bet they could listen to anything, anywhere, anytime. But so can you. I, you know, I, I'm amazed at, at uh, the amount of channels that you can get on television. I usually watch one or two. That's it. But did you know that there's hundreds of channels that you can get on TV? I, I don't know how they can afford to support themselves, but they're all over the place. And you can listen to preaching from far, far extreme off the wall to, to right on target. Now, once in a while, people will say to me, your sermon was just like Charles Stanley's today. And I say, thank God. But if they came in and named another preacher that, oh, no, 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 don't compare me. He said, because there are some out there that are on TV and they have huge audiences, but I want to tell you what they're saying doesn't line up to the Word of God. And that's why we need to teach people. And that's why every year we encourage you, read through your Bible, read through your Bible. Start in Genesis. Don't start in John. Start in Genesis and go through the whole Bible. Why? So you begin to think biblically. And when you think biblically, you're able to make right decisions. So, 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 3, Since you seek proof that Christ is speaking in me, he is not weak in dealing with you, but is powerful among you. In other words, if you are led by the Spirit of God, that is, that is easily to be caught on to. Verse 14, For he was crucified in weakness, but lives in the power of God, for we also are weak in him, but in dealing with you we live with, with him by the power of God. What Paul was saying is this, he comes in and he's being accused of being weak. He wasn't weak. He was meek. He had strength under control. He was godly. He wanted to be gracious and kind. But he, what he was saying was, don't mistake that. When someone comes in with the wrong message and they twist the word of God, Paul says, I'll be right there. And I'm not going to allow that. And that's how it ought to be in the church. The word of God needs to be properly taught and properly expounded to the congregation and if somebody comes in and starts twisting the word of God then the, then the leaders of the church need to say uh uh we're not going any further with this. Why? Because it's a twist on what God has said and we don't do that. So Paul operated in the power of the spirit not the power of the flesh and appearances can be deceiving. People thought he was weak but he was not. He was simply gracious but at the same time he was serious-minded about doing what God had called him to do. So in 2 Corinthians 13, 5, he says to them, he flips the table now on those that are accusing him. Here's what he says. Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Or do you not realize this about yourself, that Jesus Christ is in you? And if he's not, unless you fail to meet the test. And, and, and if Jesus Christ, and this is one of the things we need to do as a people, is Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior? Does he dwell within your heart? Does he command your life? You know, we tell people the road to success is Jesus is your Savior, but he's also your sovereign. He's your sovereign. And you need to understand him as your sovereign. And so he is saying, make sure that you understand that. See, the Corinthians were, were examining Paul's credentials and he flips the tables. He says, you need to examine your own credentials to make sure you're truly in Christ. Do you have the power to live a spirit-filled life of holiness and sacrifice? Are you living in carnality or are you walking in the spirit? Now, to be fair, there are a number of sins mentioned in Corinthians that are mentioned of true believers. Some of them were... Uh, Prostitution. Some of them were, one guy was sleeping with his stepmother, 1 Corinthians 5. Some were getting drunk at the Lord's table. And God dealt with them because if you're a true believer, <clears throat> God will chastise you. But 
he is not saying that Christians never sin or never fail, but he is saying that Christians are filled with the direction of pleasing God, and they don't become sinless, but they ought to be sinning less as they grow in grace, as they understand the Word of God and the power of God in their hearts and their lives. Sinlessness is not going to happen down here, though there are a few teachers, Bible teachers, who teach that there comes a point where you become sinless. However, I can assure you that's not true. I had a man come up to me once, and he said to me, I've reached that point where I do not sin. Anyone who loves Christ does not sin. I said, really? Yeah. I mean, are you telling me that you're like sinless? Yeah. I said, oh, are you sure? Yeah. I said, okay. I just have one request. What? I said, are you married? Yes. I'd like to talk to your wife. <laughs> Fix this at all. Fix this at all. And, and so we, we ought to be sinning less, but we don't become sinless. But we ought to be able to examine our lives, and we ought to say there is evidence that I am a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. He has command and control of my life, and I am walking in a way that pleases him. On October 10, 1858, Charles H. Spurgeon preached a message on this text. He had a megachurch long before people understood what megachurches were. He had 1,200 to 2,000 people a week attending his church in London, and this is way back in the 1800s. But he preached a powerful message, never minced words when it came to the gospel. Listen to what he says about checking to see if you're in the faith. First, if you would examine yourselves, begin with your public life. Are you dishonest? Can you thieve? Can you swear? Are you given to drunkenness, uncleanliness, blasphemy, taking God's name in vain, and violation of his holy day? Make short work with yourself. There will be no need to go any further, to have any further test. He that doeth these things hath no inheritance in the kingdom of God. You are retrobate. The wrath of God abideth on you. Your state is tearful. You're, you are cursed now, and except you repent, you must be accursed forever. I think he got the attention of his congregation, don't you? But he goes on. Again, another set of tests. Here it is. Private test. How about your private life? Do you live without prayer, without searching the scriptures? Do you live without thoughts of God? Can you live as a habitual stranger to the Most High, having no love to Him and no fear of Him? If so, I make short work of the matter. You are in the gall of bitterness and in the bonds of iniquity. Wow. But then he gives us encouragement. But if thou art right at heart, that will be able to say, I could not live without prayer. I have to weep over my prayers, but still I should weep ten times more if I did not pray. I do love God's Word. It is my meditation all the day. I love His people. I love His house. I can say that my hands are often lifted upward towards Him. And when my heart is busy with this world's affairs, it is often going up to His throne. A good sign, Christian, a good sign for thee. If thou canst go through this test, thou mayest hope that all is well. Test yourself to see if you're in the faith. Test yourself to see if God is your Savior and your Sovereign. Test yourself. And how do I do that? See how you walk this week. See if Christ really is ruling and reigning in your heart. And so 2 Corinthians 13, 6, I hope you will find out that we have not failed the test. Paul says, we, we passed this test. He said, I hope you figure that out too. And one reason, he says, I taught you what faith in Christ is. If I fail the test, you fail the test, he's saying. And Paul's saying, I, I'm, I'm hoping you pass that test that you've understood your need of confessing Christ, admitting you're a sinner, admitting you need a Savior, crying out to the living Savior, Lord Jesus, will you forgive me of my sins? 
and will you become my savior? That's the believer's test, but there's the, then the believer's target. How does one know they passed the test? Well, he gave us some ideas in Spurgeon's sermon, but how do we know? 2 Corinthians 13, 7, Paul lays it out. But we pray to God that you may not do wrong. Not that we may appear to have met the test, but that you may do what is right, though we may seem to have failed. Notice what Paul says, you're worried about my credentials, you need to worry about if you pass the test. And here's how you know if you pass the test, that you live a life of integrity. You do no wrong. By that he doesn't mean that you are perfect. What he is saying is that you walk carefully because Christ is your Lord. You are aware that he has captured your heart and mind and you live your life accordingly. You remember the song we used to teach kids in Sunday school? Be careful little eyes what you see. Be careful little ears what you hear. Be careful little feet where you go. For the Father up above is looking down in love. Does the sense of the presence of the living God hit you all the time? In every decision that you make, every choice that you live, God is my Savior. God is my Lord. My life is directed by my relationship with God. And I am careful what I do. The other day I was cleaning out a garage. It was just filled with clothing and all kinds of stuff. And a couple of dressers in them. I opened up a dresser and I pulled the clothes out. I was putting them in bags to take to our clothing bin. And the, underneath the clothing were two pornographic magazines. Here's what I did. I don't even want to know the name of them. Why? Because I fear God. Fearing God will direct your life. Fearing God will have you say yes to righteousness and no to sin. Knowing Christ is your Savior, and one day you'll stand before Christ and give an account of your life, will govern your steps. And it's very important that we learn how to do this. And so what does Paul say? 1 Corinthians 9.27, he's already taught them this. I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. He says, I, I, I'm telling you the truth. I am also governing my life. I am, I am disciplining my life. I am making sure that I do what pleases God. 2 Corinthians 13, 8, For we cannot do anything against the truth, but only for the truth. Now, the only one that sees you in the dark place is God. You can be in a place where no one sees you, a place of compromise, and you, no human being might see you, but God sees you. And if you live in the awareness that God sees everything that you do, and you claim that you believe in him and that he's your, Jesus is your savior and he is the sovereign of your life, it will affect every choice that you make and you will discipline yourself to holiness. And notice what he says uh, in verse 8 of chapter 13. We cannot do anything against the truth, but only for the truth. You will stick to what God's word says and you will live accordingly. Now Paul was saying... He cannot contradict the truth for the Corinthians and for all these teachers that come in. I can't bend the truth. There's a lot of preachers going around today working with bending the truth. Listen, 2 Corinthians chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6 lays it out this way. Paul said, I've applied all these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, brothers. Now notice this that you may learn by us not to go beyond what is written. There's a lot of people that are going way beyond what is written and saying this is proper for a Christian to do. This is okay for a Christian to do. And yet when you look at the principles of the word of God, it doesn't line up. And if you are a believer in Christ, you do not go beyond what is written. That's why it's so valuable that you know what is written because someone will come in and tell you something contrary, it'll sound good, but it isn't good. Cling to the word of God. 
2 Corinthians 13, 9, For we are glad when you are weak and and when we are weak and you are strong. In other words, Paul says, I don't care how you perceive me. I'm glad if you're walking with God. Your restoration is what we pray for. He says, the perception of how you see me is not the deal. The deal is, how are you with God? Are you right with God? Are you honoring God? Now, Paul's motive was for the Corinthians to mature. It wasn't for his reputation to grow. It wasn't to see how famous he could be, but how faithful he could be. 2 Corinthians 13.10 For this reason I write these things, while I am away from you, that when I come I may have, not have to be severe in my use of the authority the Lord has given me for building up and not for tearing down. Now I want you to notice this. Paul has authority as an apostle of God, but what's his goal? To build the body up, to mature them in Christ, to get them on course, to have them living a life with the expectancy of the coming of Christ and the day they will stand before God and they are convinced they will and therefore they will direct their lives accordingly. Paul wants to be an encourager. 2 Corinthians 13, 11. Finally, brothers, rejoice. Aim for restoration. Comfort one another. Agree with one another. Live in peace and the God of love and peace will be with you. The Corinthians had a lot of divisions over a lot of little things. Paul said that's not the way it's to be. Here's the thing you divide on. If, if someone is pulling you away from Christ, no, I'm not going there. And we're not going there. But if someone has a personality that doesn't affect you too well, you know what you do? You do what the Scriptures command. You love your brothers in Christ. You love them deeply from the heart. If someone says a harsh word for you, maybe out of line for a moment, what do you do? You love them in Christ, not returning insult for insult or evil for evil, but instead giving a blessing. And, and the way we respond to one another demonstrates our Christ-likeness. And when we respond that way, we live in peace and love. And boy, it's a wonderful thing when that happens. I can say after 33 years here, that's been pretty cool that our church has had such wonderful experiences of relationships. And, and not, not, not that we're perfect, uh, by all means. Sometimes I go home at night and I say, oh no, I've got to deal with that. But most of the time I go home and say this, I am so glad to be here. And I brag all the time to the other pastors. We have pastors meeting every month and, and I sometimes feel guilty. I love my church, you know, and and I brag because God has done such wonderful things in your heart and, and, and your touching of other Christians in the name of Christ is wonderful. He says, be of one mind, live in peace. And his appeal is that you be holy. And if you're holy, you will live a holy life. You will bless one another in the name of Christ. And you will bless this world as you go out and live for Christ. These verses that he's talking about speak of personal responsibility. You choose to rejoice in your heart. You choose to be kind to one another. You choose to love one another. You choose to honor God in your speech. You do that because the Spirit of God lives within you and you have surrendered to the Spirit of God. And then you say, I know I'm a believer because God has control of my life. And that's a wonderful thing when that takes place. Well, this is what perfection looks like. Not the absence of humanity, but surrender to the Spirit of God. Well, the question he asks is, are you in the faith? And you know, uh, in churches, uh, there are um, hopefully most people who come to church or sit in our service each Sunday know the Lord. But the Bible talks about wheat and tares, and it's possible to sit in a church for a long time and not really know the Lord. And that's an issue that you need to settle as soon as possible, like right now. Do you know the Lord as your Lord and Savior? That's an important issue because there's nothing more important because that settles your eternity. And then once you have come to the conclusion, I need a Savior, I am a sinner, I confess my sins. I ask Christ to be my Savior. And I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ with all my heart. Well, the next thing is the target. Are you running the race? 
Are you living in such a way with the expectancy that you will stand before Christ and you will hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You have been faithful. And that's, that's the goal of every believer. And whatever bumps hit us in the course of life, the one thing they don't get us off course on is I want to please the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to run that race with all my heart. And then you just somehow or other you get this understanding. I belong to Jesus. And Jesus belongs to me. What better understanding can you come to? Let's pray together. Lord, help us to run that race. Help us to know for sure, I believe in Jesus. And then I'm living for Jesus. And be glorified in our lives, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you and God bless you.